We are joined live in the KODX studios by Ari Cohn. He is the founder and director of the Post-Prison Education Program. And Rachel Sievers, she is the program attorney with Disability Rights Washington. And me talking about the related issues to Disability Rights Washington and the, uh, the intersection with issues that uh, Post-Prison Education Program uh, wrestles with, as well as a upcoming event that uh, Post-Prison Education Program has uh, coming up next week at Town Hall Seattle. So uh, Ari Cohn, if you would uh, start out and um, get things going. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Rachel and how we met and just uh, bullet point her work and then leave it for you to talk about. So in, in, in two, 100 years ago, 2007 or six or something, um, there was a reentry task force and the idea came into being to have an ombudsman to see the Department of Corrections. And we fought, we led that effort for years and then we pulled back and uh, some other people, Melody Simley and others in the community stepped up and Bill kept not passing. Year after year, it didn't pass. And so somewhere around May of 2016, I think it was, uh, Disability Rights Washington got involved. And as a result, uh, the ombuds legislation passed and there's an independent ombuds. Uh, and that's, she'll probably say that's not totally to their credit, but it's very much to their credit. And then, uh, so that's one thing I want you to talk about, if, but, but more about the AF AVID program. So, uh, and then the recent legislation or litigation with the Department of Corrections that dealt with people suffering mental illness and how they're treated differently, for example, in the Washington State Penitentiary than in the Monroe Correctional Complex. And then True Blood. So, um, I think uh, Disability Rights Washington, I'm pretty, in my mind, is the most respected. Uh, entity in the field where we operate in the state and it's kind of cherished and worshipped by everybody I know um, or value and uh, Rachel's right in the heart of it so you could talk about Ombuds or Avid or True Blood and then I want to make sure we talk about uh, next Wednesday's event at Town Hall and and with Pete Early, Rachel will be on the panel, and another attorney from Disability Rights Washington, who Rachel will talk about, Kim will be on the panel, Jenny uh, from NAMI will be on the panel, one of our students. So, how about it? Okay. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I think we did we did meet during the Ombuds effort. Um, just so people know, if you're not familiar with Disability Rights Washington, um, we are a federally funded public interest law firm. Um, we get about 50% of our funding from the federal government, essentially to protect and advocate on behalf of people with disabilities. Um, with that federal authority, we also get, um, with that funding, we get federal authority. And the authority lets us go anywhere people with disabilities are served. Um, and so that includes state hospitals, nursing homes, adult family homes, schools, um, and about five years ago, we realized that our constituents, the people that we work on behalf of, people with disabilities, were in the prisons and jails. Um, and so we started a specific project, um, AVID, which is Amplifying Voices of Inmates with Disabilities, to really focus in on those constituents with 30% of the prison population na nationwide reporting they have a disability and 40% of the jail population. We really felt like it was important to go into those settings. Um, and when we started doing that work, realized that there is really, there was no oversight, right? There's no oversight entity uh, for the prisons and certainly not for the jails, which are all their own independent little fiefdoms all over the state. Um, and after doing that work for a couple years, really started to think about how can we ensure that there is additional oversight in these settings. They are closed doors by definition. They are some of our most vulnerable people because they are completely controlled in the environment that they're in. Um, and a lot of people there have disabilities. And so we sort of looked around and saw this coalition that had been working for years to establish an ombuds office, which would provide that kind of independent oversight. Um, and you guys had done so much educating with lawmakers and work around the issue. Um, and 
I think what we brought to that was um, someone who'd been doing it for two years, who'd been in the prisons and doing essentially that kind of prison oversight to say, yes, this is a real need. This is something we have been literally walking the tears, talking to people that have all of these issues. And if you want to avoid litigation, if you want to know about things early, you really need someone who is able to do this full time for the whole state, um, for all issues, not just disability related issues. So we were really excited to see the ombuds pass. Um, I know everybody <laughs> was. And uh, you know, it certainly is somewhere that we wanted as a resource for ourselves and our constituents, right? We get so many calls. We take calls from every state prison, every jail. We respond to every call and letter that we get from people. Um, we have four attorneys in the prison project, um, and we cover prisons and jails, and I'm the only full-time prison attorney. So we have a limited number of people to do the work, and so we were really excited to see the ombuds come on board as a place where we could also refer people who had issues that weren't disability related that we couldn't take on. Um, so we are very excited that they're up and running, and I think they've been around for about a year now. I think mm -hmm. they've been up and running yeah. for a year and have released some systemic reports and, and are um, working on a grievance, grievance work group with us and DOC to try and address that system. Um, so I think they're doing some really good work. Um, some of the other things that we have been working on with AVID, um, some of the things that you mentioned, um, we think about advocacy in sort of three, four, sort of four different ways. Um, levels of intervention. First level is sort of technical assistance, right? So people call us, we give them information, we give them resources um, on how to try to work through the system. So what words do you need to use in a request for mental health? What, how do you appeal something? What's the time frame? How do you sort of work through that system? Um, if you can't write a grievance because you have a cognitive disability, how do you access an alternative means of communicating? How do you make that request? So working with people to try to sort of educate them and work with them to increase their advocacy ability within the system. Um, so we do a lot of that. That's what our phone calls and letters are. Our second level is sort of individual representation. It's usually not in court. It's usually working with someone and doing sort of informal advocacy. So because we're in the prisons a lot, um, we usually know who the head of mental health is at the facility or who their counselor is or who the medical provider is. And um, it is easier for us sometimes to cut through some of the miscommunication that might be happening at the facility level to cut through that and say, like, can someone just find the guy his shoes? Like, can, can we just, like, stop the kites back and forth and just someone please just get the shoes out of property? Um, and so that is sometimes what we do in terms of individual representation is really trying to step in and just get someone the service that they're trying to get if they've been really unsuccessful doing it themselves. Um, and then we do systemic advocacy. So similarly, like trying to get something for large groups of people. And we do litigation. Um, so we try really hard not to sue people. Um, as a lawyer, that pains me to say <laughs> uh, because I love to sue people. But um, it does take a long time, right? It, it is not a, it's a hammer. It's not a delicate way to resolve an issue. It's not a fast way to resolve an issue. Um, it is something that I think often slows down change. If you have an entity that might be willing to make changes, the second you file litigation, they become defensive, right? They're, they're, they're defending against change then. And so we have historically, AVID, tried really hard not to bring lawsuits and have been pretty successful working collaboratively with the Department of Corrections to try and deal with some of the things that we bring up. Um, I think one of the issues that we have recently uh, not been as successful <laughs> about um, was the lawsuit that you mentioned. Um, it was a case that we had been talking to the Department of Corrections about for probably a couple years. Um, so we had gotten calls from people at the Washington State Penitentiary in the bar units, which is their sort of mental health housing there. Um, there are about 150 people in those units. And we'd gotten calls from them reporting that they were being held at this custody level called close custody, um, which is right below max. So you're locked down pretty much 15 hours a day. Um, and we were getting calls from people saying, hey, I'm minimum custody. Like, I, I have followed the rules and done the things, and I should be at this way lower custody level, but I'm stuck here in this unit, in this close custody level, um, just because I need mental health services, because that's where they're provided. Um, and so we investigated. So usually what we do is we sort of do this big document request because we can get records as part of our federal authority. We can get 
bunch of records from people. We can go in and talk to them. So we did a big investigation and then notified Department of Corrections of our findings and sort of said, hey, we think you have a, a legal problem. We think that the ADA uh, specifically applies in prisons, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and um, actually has implementing regulations that are really specific and say, you can't house someone with a disability in a higher custody level than they are supposed to be in, simply due to their need for disability-related services. It's really specific, which is very handy. It's not actually, doesn't seem to be that often used in litigation, but I think the, the implementing regulations for the Americans with Disabilities Act in relation to prison are really, really fantastic. And, and, um, and, and it was exciting for us to be able to use them in litigation. Um, so we sort of alerted DOC to it and it became clear after a couple meetings with them that the change that we were talking about would require a bunch of money. And as you know, in Washington State, it's very hard to shake loose money from the legislature. Um, so it became clear to us sort of talking to them that to get what we wanted done, which was a lot of physical plant changes, increased programming, increased time out for this population, was going to take money they didn't have or didn't have budgeted for this particular purpose. Um, so we filed the lawsuit and you know, went into discovery and started reviewing thousands of pages of documents about people who were in the bar units and, and really started to look at this unit that had people in close custody, but then also looked at the special offender unit, which is at Monroe. So in Washington state, there are two mental health housing units. One is the bar unit, the other is SOU. Um, and the SOU has different custody levels, right? So if you're maximum custody, you can be on this unit. If you're medium custody, you can be on this unit. If you're close, you're on this one. Um, so you can sort of progress through those units in theory. So as you sort of, <coughs> as you gain privileges, as you, um, you know, sort of meet your treatment goals, meet your programming goals, you can get more time out of cell, more privileges. So that's available at the SOU it wasn't available at the bar units. And so really to us, the, the question became, why can't the bar units be like the SOU? You, you've done it here, you know how to do it. It's something you do for this other unit, just like this one. And why can't we incorporate that at the bar units? So we did a lot of discovery and then entered into negotiations with the Department of Corrections and, and entered into a settlement that just got issued and the court approved it in um, June of this, of this year. And I think, the, the case itself, actually, DRW acted as the organizational plaintiff, which I think is a unique um, idea and not something that a lot of places can do. So it means that it's not a class action. Um, we can act as, as the plaintiff on behalf of the people that we represent, which is people with disabilities in the prisons. Um, so that case was settled in June, and we've started a sort of work plan with the Department of Corrections over the next couple of years. And, and the big, some of the big changes, it's about, like I said, about 150 people roughly, and we found that about half of them were being held at the wrong custody level. So a lot of them were minimum, medium, so and that means you can open your door on your own, right? You can come and go. You have a key to your room, which is kind of mind-blowing for people that are coming from close custody who are used to guards controlling all of their time and their access to their cell, and they're only out, you know, a really tiny period of every day, to being somewhere where you can open and close your door. Uh, and I know, you know, we've had clients who've moved from close to medium, and that is the part where they're like, wait, I, have, like, I can come and go and I have a key? What? Uh, and so <laughs> that was, that's a big thing. And so one of the things they have to do with the bar units is, is actually retrofit the doors in some of the units so that they can be operated by humans with keys. Um, because right now they're sort of main control, only the guards can open and close them all at the same time. And so that's a, a big change that they're going to have to do. And then hiring a bunch of staff, because if you have people out and about and actually going to programming, you have to have staff doing that programming. Um, so they, as part of the settlement negotiation, requested, I think it was about $5 million to implement the settlement terms, and they were granted it by the legislature. Um, it specifically in their budget request sort of said, in response to this lawsuit, we're asking for this much money to fix it. Which, again, I wish that wasn't how Washington works, but it seems like right now, that's how you get money for things. Um, and so. That money was provided, and we're excited to see changes coming. I think we'll start to see things out at the bar units changing in the next couple months. You know, I've been in the bar units, and I've been in, like, Washington, Washington State Penitentiary, to me, is like three separate prisons. East Complex, which is low security, then medium, and then the West Complex, which is mostly closed custody or high security. And 
I've been in SOU at Monroe. And I'm trying to think of how you, how for listeners, we could kind of paint a picture of what kind, how the movement takes place. So like the East Complex at the Washington State Penitentiary, the, 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 cell, the barred cells, this is the whole part of the penitentiary, those doors are open. Mm -hmm. and, and, and those men go outside and maybe they're mowing grass or doing electrical work or they're out on the yard or they're growing tomatoes mm -hmm. or whatever. The, the bar units are like three round buildings in Boris, Baker, Adams, and Rainier. Um, and, and just when you walk up to them, they're, you get the feeling like that the Russians could drop a nuclear missile on those buildings and it wouldn't even chip the concrete. <laughs> I mean, they're really, it's, it's really, it's, uh, but just in terms of being somebody that's suffering mental illness and locked up in the bar units versus being at SOU in, in medium custody and being able to program, can you kind of mm -hmm. try to paint a picture? Because I'm sitting here thinking yeah. I can't do it. It's like, it's, it's hard to, to paint a picture of what these facilities are, how different they are, but they're hugely, hugely different. Yeah, um, I think that, you know, when you walk into close custody, um, mostly no one's out, right? The doors are all closed. There might be a couple guys in the day room. Um, you can't really, in the bar units, you couldn't current, in the close custody version of the bar units, you can't bring anything into the day room to do generally, so you can, you have a couple hours a day where you can go into the day room, which is a, a nice word for a concrete room um, with some spider tables, which <laughs> is a is a sort of DOC term, I guess, for a concrete table with concrete stools you can't move. Um, and so, you know, you can't bring much out, so what's the point of going to day room, really? Um, you can't come and go. Mostly no one's out. Uh, some of the things that we looked at when we were sort of comparing the... SOU and the bar units were what's the level of programming? How much are people engaging in programming? What programming is available? And, you know, we were trying to draw a comparison between you get this many hours of programming. Say you get, you know, four hours a day of programming in one place and you get four hours a week in another place. And that's different, right? And you should be entitled to the amount that's appropriate to you. And as part of our discovery, we actually talked to some experts in the field who have worked as experts in cases like this. And, and one of their points, which I think we were all sort of embarrassed that we hadn't focused on more, was how much being locked down that much actually impacts the therapeutic goals of the environment, right? Um, so we hear a lot about segregation being really bad for people with mental health needs, uh, being locked down 24 hours a day being really bad for people, but being locked 15 hours a day is also very bad for you, right? And, and whether you can access the kinds of programming that would help you, um, you know, work on your treatment plan, work on your programming, uh, chemical dependency, education programming, just a lot of things that should be available to people aren't if you're locked down 15 hours a day. Um, access to outside, right? Just literally being outside. So it was something that when we started the case, really asked, one of the things that we asked for was a chart that sort of showed us, what does it look like if you're in medium, in education, in jobs, in yard, which is outside, um, outside of cell time, just period. Um, and then what does it look like when you're in close? And then what does it look like when you're in this kind of close? Because we found that actually, because it was a mental health unit, it was even run a little bit differently than regular close custody and a little bit more restrictive either, even than you would find in like general population. Um, so, you know, but when you go to the SOU, when you go to medium custody, when you go to a place that isn't this sort of lockdown close custody, there are couches with cushions. Um, they're not super cozy, but they're not spider tables. Um, there are, you know, people sort of sitting in the day room watching TV. The door to the yard is open. People are sort of coming and going in and out of their room. Um, so it's, you know, it is a place where you can move around versus the bar units and you kind of walk in and there's no one moving. And there's no outdoors. And there's no grass and there's no, there's just no outdoors, right? Not immediately accessible. Yeah. No, I mean yeah. there are, there are yards, so you can get to a yard at your specific time of day that you're allowed to go, um, and there are specific times that you can get to the sort of bigger yard, mm -hmm. the grass. Um, but it's not like the medium security where you can sort of c 
come and go um, more easily where you are able to, you know, leave your room, oh, you forgot a book, you're going to go back and get your book, you're going to come back out, you're going to go outside, talk to someone outside in the yard, come back in. I mean, it's not, it's not at all a way that you can practice your coping skills either. So if you're thinking about people who are progressing towards release or people who are progressing towards living in the community, um, how you practice the skills that you may have learned in any kind of treatment programming you go to are really hard if you are alone in a room most of the day. You know, Mike, you're being awful quiet. You can't get away with that all for the whole hour. <laughs> but we were sitting, Rachel and I were sitting over at the Starbucks across the street, and I opened up our sales force and uh, our database, and I showed Rachel this one person who's sort of driven, his circumstances are really sad. And he's, he's back, I think, first time, 90, 1994. His diagnosis is schizoaffective disorder, and um, he's now back in prison for his 10th time. And in my mind, he's not a criminal. He breaks laws. So I want, to, I want you to talk about who these people are that, that you're working for mm -hmm. um, in their humanity um, and, and that this society has criminalized mental illness, which I think is just irrefutable. And, I, and um, um, but just kind of talk, maybe talk about some of the people, specific people. This guy, um, Native American from a very poor, abject poverty family in Clark County. No education at any level. His parents, I've talked to his mom. She does. She can't understand the diagnosis, but. Uh, He'll, he's already spent almost all of his life, and it's about this diagnosis. It's not that he's a lawbreaker. Again, he breaks laws, but, you know, I think if you're, um, if you have a diagnosis like he has, which is really, I always wonder, like, what, what if you're schizoaffective disorder, what did you do to piss God off so bad? that you got stuck with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder all in one body. It's because that's really what schizoaffective disorder is. And so if you're, if you have that diagnosis, um, and I'll just tell you quickly the story I told Rachel and I'm going to let Rachel talk about these men and women. But it's like when the Department of Corrections reached out to us about this guy in 2010, I sent two people up to SOU uh, to interview him to see whether we would make a commitment to help. And they spent, one was a PsyD, so that's the equivalent of a PhD, but, but clinical rather than research, and the other had a four-year degree <coughs> in human services, and they spent three hours with this, with this man. And when, and they were traveling together. When they left, uh, Corey sent me, and that was the PsyD, she sent a text message, and she said, Ari, he's too sick. So she was like, we can't help. He's beyond help, really. Um, and then Holly sent a text message that said, Ari, he's so sick, we have to help. So uh, we never had the opportunity because county of origin caused him to be released back to his county of origin where there are no resources and, 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 and all. But I just don't see him or anybody like him as being the kind of criminal, quote-unquote, that the Seattle Times likes the headline. Uh, I just see poverty and lack of education and horrible diagnosis and people really suffering. So, like, can you talk about the people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think what we've seen a lot of is a lack of community resources for people. Um, I think, you know, they can... You can do everything um, you want to prepare somebody, but if you're coming into the community and there's nothing there for you, if you're going to a county that doesn't have any resources, if you're going out and there is no one there to support you, it um, doesn't matter what your diagnosis is or how well you prepared you were. It's a, it's a really, really tough transition for people. Um, a couple years ago, we did a, a video about reentry. So 
um, we decided to follow three people with disabilities and sort of follow them through the reentry process from Department of Corrections out into the community. And we took our cameras, because we can do that with our authority. And it's fun to take your cameras into the prisons. Um, and we went out and we followed three people. And, um, you know, I sort of thought, well, it's, you know, DOC knows who we're following. So, of course, they're going to have these, like, amazing release plans. And they're going to have a person set up to see them. And they're going to have a housing situation that's really great. Um, and we followed the three people. And um, there is one moment in it where that is sort of striking. And it's on our website, so you can see it. But the someone leaving who has a mental health diagnosis on his way literally to the gate to walk out of the prison accidentally passes by his mental health provider at the prison and says, oh, hey, hey, like, do you know if I have anyone to, that I'm supposed to see on the outside? And they sort of remember, oh, yeah, like, I'll get it to you. But it was only this sort of, like, accidental passing towards the exit of the prison that that connection was made. Um, and this is someone that everyone knew we were following. It's on tape. I mean, it was sort of, it was astounding to me that even with that level of attention, there wasn't a better plan for people. Um, and so we followed them, you know, sort of preparing people being really nervous about releasing and not knowing where they were going, knowing they had $40 and literally nothing else, um, who had not been successful in the past, talking about how they made it one week, two weeks last time, and, and wondering how they would fare this time um, with no supports. And then following them when they were in the community, and then, you know, at the end, spoiler, all three end up back in the criminal justice system pretty shortly thereafter. Um, and I think what we have really been looking at and something that another lawsuit, DRW, has been involved with True Blood, uh, is really about how do you build those community supports so that people are coming out with some kind of resource. Because uh, a lot of the people we work with, we focus a lot on, obviously, people with disabilities. A lot of those, you know, 30% of our population nationwide identifies as having disability. In Washington State prisons, like 26% of the male population is identified as having mental health needs, enough that the prisons register them. Um, that about half of the female population, which I found sort of shocking that half of the women's population is, even by DOC standards, identified as having mental health needs. Um, so there are, uh, it's a huge number of people, that's well over 5,000 people in our system who are using the mental health services within the Department of Corrections who are coming back out into communities needing supports. Um, a lot of those people are spending time in segregation, right? Uh, when we did research into segregation in Washington State, we found that people with mental health needs spend longer periods in prison because they get infracted and they don't, they get punished for behaviors that are related to their disability, like um, hurting themselves or uh, yelling at guards, um, flooding their toilets, sort of, you know, disturbances in the prison world. Um, but we find those people, you know, they end up in segregation. So now they're locked down. And because of their mental health needs and, and their mental health issues, can't really work themselves out of segregation, right? So now we have someone who has mental health needs who's in a locked room, sometimes on suicide watch, which is even worse. Um, who have now spent maybe years, if not a decade, in this kind of environment, and then we're releasing them to the community with $40. Um, there are some reentry programs that Department of Corrections has that try and support people, um, but I have had plenty of people release who I wondered how on earth they're not in those programs. Like, why is this person not eligible? Um, and in those circumstances, they, you know, they are literally going from 24-hour lockdown or even restraints mm -hmm. to the community, um, into, uh, you know, temporary housing or shelter or an apartment and they have $40 and no furniture, right? And so what are we setting people up for in that scenario? And how are we supporting them when they have had some, you know, for some people have never seen a cell phone? Right? How do you how do you even get to somewhere? If you are in a new county you haven't been in, if you haven't been in the world in the last 10 years, what's an ORCA card? I mean, it's just sort of these basic things that we don't set people up for. Um, and, and I think a lot of the work that needs to be done really is building those community resources and that handoff so that people aren't just coming out and being left to fend for themselves. 
without any kind of guidance or any kind of support, but having, you know, peer mentors, having that sort of warm handoff where someone is saying, like, hey, you know, community custody person, let's have you escort someone to their first mental health appointment so that they can actually make that appointment and get the connection to their mental health medications set up so that we're not just opening the door and saying good luck. You know, you just reminded me, something you said reminded me that I think the culprit in all this is the Washington State Legislature and not the Department of Corrections, and I firmly believe that. Uh, but another thing, when you talked about percentages, that reminded me of some numbers that I got from Scott Brakes and Cheryl Strange that I want to mention. But the last thing you just said reminds me of a prisoner releasing from, from the Monroe Correctional Complex a couple months ago. And they call the day before he's going to release. Mike, you've been in this prison with us, Twin Rivers. And we didn't have an application from this guy. So we, we didn't know and hadn't met him, but somebody on DOC staff called, and they were like, this guy's going to release this week into nothingness. That's what I call it, nothingness. Mm -hmm. And can you, can you get involved? So we, everybody turned the tables upside down, and he filled out. We got an application to a counselor, and he filled out the application, and then it got scanned into us. So now we know his name. We can get him in the database. But that didn't change the fact the department was so worried about this guy based on his criminal history and his mental health diagnosis and on top of everything else and that they that they took him I've never seen them actually do this they drove him so somebody from DOC at Twin Rivers drove him down to Seattle he was his county of origin was Olympia and then the CCO from Olympia drove up picked him up, so it was a halfway, mm -hmm. halfway handoff, took him back to Olympia, but in terms of taking him to his mental health provider, like you just talked about, all they did was just, they did the DOC check-in. You've got to check in within 24 hours of release. So that was accomplished at the Department of Corrections office, and then he was released into homelessness on the streets of Olympia. And, and with for 40 bucks, khakis and like nothing else including no roof over your head and a serious diagnosis and really no chance of even having food for the next day or anything really mm -hmm. it, and that's that's reentry and you know if you Saturday and then I'll, uh, we had a guy we we had actually gone up to Airway Heights and we interviewed two guys a couple of weeks ago so this guy we knew. We worked a lot with him on the phones. So we knew he was going to arrive Saturday. We knew he had no housing, courtesy of the state anyway, and no nothing, no bus pass, no cell mm -hmm. phone, nothing. So we closed at 2 on Saturdays. We stayed. We were going to stay as late as it took for him to arrive. He got to the office about 4.04. Um, and he walked in in khakis. In the all, no clothes other than the khakis on his back. So he goes down the street. It's obvious. He might as well have a flashing neon sign. I just a, a release from prison. He had a plastic box with some paperwork. And that was it, right? And he'd been on the bus all day from, from Spokane, basically, Airway Heights. So, so for the state's part, that's where he was. He was, he was homeless. We, we, uh, Took him to Red Robin. It was a Saturday, so he didn't have to check in until Monday. So we took him to Red Robin and bought a meal. And then we uh, put him in a hotel. We actually put him uh, in an expensive hotel. We put him in the Hampton Inn at Northgate, and, and the bill was like over $200, right? Um, and we took him downstairs to our clothing room and got some non-khakis on him. And the next day, we picked him up um, and got him back to the office again. And we took him out to an Oxford house in Shoreline. We had three interviews arranged at three different Oxford houses because the residents have to let you in. And the first interview at Shoreline, they voted him in. And so that, and then the Oxford house won't take 
checks or cash. So then I had to go find a Bank of America, get an ATM, get the money out. Then I had to go to a 7-Eleven in downtown Shoreline, buy a money order, dash back to the Oxford house, and, and a co-worker of mine, Shalisha, who you've met, Mike, was sitting at the Oxford house with this guy. And so he had a home as of that night. And then we and we bought him some groceries at a QFC. And then the next day did the DOC check-in with the Northgate office. But if we hadn't, you know, I think of us as a small, podunk, pissant, little, teeny, tiny, super underfunded nonprofit. If we hadn't been there, um, I don't, you know, he, he probably would have violated. Uh, it, it, so, so that's what people are being released into, and, and that's that's reentry. You know, going back to the statistics, and we've got twenty three minutes. Always well, amazes me how the hour goes. But you know, you talked about percentage of males and females with mental health diagnoses that are horrible. Um, in 2010, we had so many people referred to us by the Department of Corrections that that I wrote Cheryl Strange, who at the, she's now Secretary of DSHS, but at the time she was Deputy Secretary of the DOC, and I wrote her an email, and I said I used the word that I can't use on the air here, or we or Mike loses his FCC license, but I was how F possibly G many are there like this of the 700 who release from prison every month how many have this kind of di these kinds of diagnosis and Cheryl uh, just totally missed it she she guessed that it was a hundred out of the 700 and that are s code two three four five or worse and those are all indicators of mental illness so like months later I was at a graduation speaking at in the WSR unit at Monroe, and Scott Frakes was there. And Scott's now head of DOC in Nebraska. And um, and I asked Scott, I, t I said, this is what Cheryl said, it, you know, it, it, how wrong is she or is she right? And he said, no, it's got to be at least 146 of the 700. But if, if you divide that, that's a pretty significant mm -hmm. percentage, right? But recently, is, is it just keeps happening Recently, uh, we've gotten data from the Department of Corrections that showed, uh, and I think I'm going to have this on a PowerPoint at Town Hall mm -hmm. uh, Wednesday night, but uh, I am going to have it on a PowerPoint. And, uh, but we've gotten data that shows that uh, more than 34 percent of Washington's prisoners have these serious mental health diagnoses. And then a year or so after that, I asked DOC to update it, and they gave me new data that showed 39 percent. Mm -hmm. So you know we're really close to ha to to uh, having 50 percent half half of Washington's prisoners suffer mental illness, and 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 that's that's unbelievable. You know, it's it, so. And who's re who's responsible for that? To me, it's the Roger Goodmans. You don't have to buy off on any of this. Jeannie Darnells, Jay Inslee, so, you know Sonia Hallams, um, Tim Ormsby. I'm thinking at town hall, I'm going to have a, a picture of Ormsby on the screen when people come into the great hall, and it's going to see public enemy number one. But I might have Inslee's picture there. I don't know. But anyway, I mean, who's responsible for this? We've taken. Poor people that come come from poverty with horrible diagnosis that they're often introduced to drugs when they're four years old, six years old, eight years old by their parents, and we're just persecuting them in my mind till the day they die. Mm -hmm. So, like, what's the solution and who's responsible? Yeah, and I maybe mean, it's the voters. Yeah, I mean that. I think we are. I mean, I, I think yeah. it's. Um, you know, I'm working on stuff right now about trying to get housing for people coming out of state hospitals who got treatment, and none of the communities want them, right? So no one can build a house that will house these people. No one can license something that will house them. No one is voting for things that will get money for these types of programs. Um, 
you know, the legislature responds to what voters want, and voters aren't demanding that prisoners get better mental health treatment, aren't demanding that people in our releasing get housing vouchers for longer. I mean, there, there are a lot of things that um, are happening in other states across the country. I think there's a big movement for criminal justice reform. I think we as voters and we as a society don't think of this as our problem. They don't, we don't think of it as 95% of people in our prisons come back to the community. Um, that's a huge, you know, that's almost everyone. And do you want people to come back somewhere that's safe and supported, or do you want people to come back to nothing? Do you want people to come back having been locked in a tiny room in a suicide smock for years, or do you want them to come back having gotten drug treatment? Um, you know, so sort of what do you, what do you value and what impacts you? I think we don't, we need to take a step back and think of it as that broader picture, because I do th I think it's us. I mean, I think, I think that's who we blame is us. Um, it's a convenient place to have people and you don't see what's happening in the prisons because they have walls. There's 20,000 people in them and we don't know what's happening. Um, and, and a lot of people aren't you know, paying attention because there's a lot of other, a lot of other stuff going on too. Um, I think you know, the, there have been a lot of really interesting things and I almost never talk about ALEC as being something I ever agree with, the sort of right wing. No policy think tank. I know, right? The face is <laughs> like, what gone. are you going to say? <laughs> now, um, you, now Mike woke up. I know, up. <laughs> right? Uh, but they, they actually, because it is a money saver and it is the sort of criminal justice reform Koch brother kind of situation, um, they have some interesting policy initiatives about promoting positive supervision. So incentivizing corrections officers to have positive outcomes for their people because right now, there's nothing, there's no incentive for DOC and corrections to not violate someone for, for not coming and checking it, right? There's no reason why they should not violate someone. If they don't and something happens, they get sued, right? So, so they violate people um, or they don't support them. They don't do the thing, the chain of events that you described that you did where you take someone and you get them closed and you set them up. That's all something that in theory a corrections supervision person could be doing yeah. in the community, right? And so so but there they are, can't do because the legislature has given the Department them. of Corrections the money to do it. Right, right? and so there, okay. are these, there are these systems where you, you know, for every person that gets a job on your caseload, you get an incentive. For every person who makes it through drug treatment, who gets a college degree, who gets a full-time job, like, you can incentivize those positive outcomes for the supervising entity. Um, and that's, I think that is something when you, you know, fine, I will incentivize people to do the right thing. That's fine with me if we can just get people on the same page that we are supporting these people, not punishing them, and not continuing this sort of really archaic version of supervision that really isn't supporting people and isn't doing anybody any better. I want to switch the subject because we're running out of time. But on the Internet, I saw a picture of somebody named Rachel Sievers, you, and my neighbor, Sonia mm -hmm. Hardbrook, accepting the Chapman Award uh, for the Foundation for Improvement of Justice in Atlanta mm -hmm. just a week ago. So, and that was for AVID programs work. So can you just tell us why, uh, why the Foundation awarded that to Disability Rights Washington for AVID's work? Um, yeah, so that w award was something uh, that is given out to six people a year, six organizations, and it's for people who sort of demonstrated effectiveness in criminal justice reform. So it's not, it's interesting, it's not forward-looking, it's not saying we'll give you money to do this in the future, it's saying we're giving you money to support the work that you've done so you can keep doing it, which is unusual, as you know. Mm -hmm. Grants usually come with all kinds of strings that you have mm -hmm. to deliver on deliverables. This was based on work we'd already done. Um, so that means we get to look forward and start thinking about what other work among the many, many things remains to be done. Um, I think the thing that we're really looking at this year really closely that you've probably, that you, I think you've been around a little bit on is the sort of post-conviction review and the aging prisoner population um, and thinking about how, again, if you think about what are our prisons designed to do, it's not to take care of people with the health needs and it's not to take care of old people, right? It's not, if you imagine someone with dementia or your grandma, like in a seclusion cell, that's not a good place for someone to be. Um, and so we have about 20% of our prison population is aging in Washington State um, over the age of 50, some of whom spent decades. And so we're working, one of the things that we are looking forward to in the next legislative session is this sort of post-conviction review idea, which actually Senator Darnielle sponsored something last year 
related to this, um, to have a way to look at people who've served decades in prison and how can we support their reentry into the community. Um, so it's that kind of work that we were excited because we can keep doing that with grants like we got from the foundation. Can you talk a minute? I want to like take the next 14 minutes and divide mm -hmm. it between next week's town hall um, and and young blood or true blood. Yeah. So like, can you talk about Kim and you know, Display Rights Washington at True Blood, mm -hmm. and Judge Peckman's decision, and how that fits into all yeah. this because it's crazy important. Yes, it is. Yeah, fourteen minutes for True Blood. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. So True Blood, um, it's you know, it's a it's a giant case. It started as a policy initiative. We were working to try and so basically, it's about people who have been arrested, brought to the jails found to lack capacity to proceed and need competency restoration services, right? So they need mental health treatment so they can be competent to proceed to trial or they can decide if they can't be restored that they get mental health treatment. But we found that these people were sitting in jail for months and months. And if prison is a bad place to be with mental health needs, jail is even worse, um, usually in segregation in really dire circumstances. And so, you know, for years worked with trying to get a legislative fix for that. The jails couldn't come into compliance. The state hospitals couldn't come into compliance with any kind of reasonable time frame. So um, the lawsuit was filed a few years ago, went all the way through trial, appeals. The state still was not in compliance, even after we won at trial. Um, and then as a result, started racking up contempt fees. So for every day that they weren't in, in compliance with the time frame that had been set by the court with, you know, once someone is in jail, you have this long to get them evaluated, right? So you have to, like, move this forward. Um, a contempt fee was assigned for every time that they missed that boat. And it ballooned up to millions of dollars. Yeah. I think it was $80 million yeah. maybe at yeah, some point. Um, and so that, those contempt fees then started being used as a, a grant process. So there was, a, there was a process for people to, agencies that work with people on diversion, and other uh, pre-trial diversion or re-entry services or in-jail services, um, there's a process where people were applying for grants to do these kinds of services because it really, to us, seemed part of the reason why people are even coming into the jail in the first place is there's nowhere that police are taking them other than the jail when someone calls a mental health crisis, right? And so what began is us sort of using those contempt fees to support community supports instead of just having people in jail or the state hospital um, has now sort of morphed after continued negotiation with the state. It's now a settlement, the True Blood settlement, um, which is really, I think, broader than what the original lawsuit, which is really focused on competency delay. And what we did was sort of backed up and said, why are so many people even in the system, right? You, you have this huge delay because you have all these people in the system. What if you could just get, stop people from getting in the system? What if you can stop people from entering the front door or when they go out the back door of the jail, support them so they don't come back in the front door? Uh, and so really looking at the sort of sequential intercept model is what they have been really focused on. And last year there was a bunch of legislation to support a lot of these programs, which is, you know, when someone has a mental health crisis, who do you call? If it's the police, do they have training when they come in? Is there a, is there a clinical person with them? Are there peer supports to work with people when they're coming out? Is there supported housing where people can live when they're coming out? Is there pretrial diversion so that people can go um, be diverted out of the jail if they have low-level crimes? So there are, there are a bunch of different places where they have focused their efforts in, in the True Blood settlement to try and fund community supports that will get people at these different intercept points to really keep them out of the system entirely if that can be done and supported in the community instead. Um, so Kim Mosoff is an attorney with the uh, Disability Rights Washington. She's on our treatment team. And she was in the AVID project for, for years and worked on the jails and then moved over to the treatment team and, and uh, took her jail knowledge with her and now is also counsel for True Blood. Uh, and so she will be at town hall talking in much more detail, I'm sure, than I can about her work on True Blood and, and what you can see changing in the community as a result of that. You know, um I want to town hall, Pete Early. Mm -hmm. Our experience um, has been with high numbers, relatively high numbers, what Pete Early's experience was with his son. So for, for listeners who uh, aren't familiar with the story, uh, you can Google P. 
Pete Early, E-A-R-L-E-Y. He was a Washington Post reporter until his son had what I would call a psychotic break. And so Pete was in Washington, D.C., and his son, I think, was in New York, and he devolved into schizophrenia, and, um, and Pete dropped basically his career and everything else. And in his, in his wonderful book, Crazy, um, he, he talks about what, what transpired, but he, he consulted with his wife, and, and, and as a family unit, they decided to pull out all the stops and support their son, right? And so after interactions with police and law enforcement and, 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 and one disaster after another, Pete calls it America's mental health madness, which is probably a pretty good description, uh, it's now years later, and his son is doing extremely well, which he'll talk about at town hall, but it's because he got the support that he needed. And so with, with, with us, you know, in 2009, DOC pretty much badgered me into spending $21,000 on an outcome data study to have researchers look at our effectiveness. And at that time, we'd had nobody recidivate. And which is not the case now, but we still got high numbers. And, and uh, so as soon as that was reported to the legislature, then the question became like, why? Why does somebody who's been to prison five, six, seven times over 10, 15 years with mental health problems and, and addiction problems going back to adolescence, why do they just continually be a recidivating machine until they get involved with post-prison education program and then the bullshit stops. I can say that, right? Tell, tell the SEC to go on vacation for a minute. So, so, uh, the, uh, <laughs> you did, all right. So, so but the, the insanity stops, whatever. And, and 92.13% of the time, according to the, to the University of Washington, they can build lives worth living. And, um, and, and, and be successful. And it's, so to me, it's just a matter of support versus no support. And, um, and that's what we're going to, we'll talk about at, at Town Hall, the problems and in the, in the, in the solutions. Um, so we'll have uh, Pete's flying in. By, by the way, the, t the title of the event is The Biggest Lie Ever Told. So you can search that on Google. You'll come up with the event on Town Hall Seattle's website. You'll come up with a bunch of Facebook links. We put it out to our list service a couple times. Uh, and the, I think the biggest lie that's ever to been told, probably, maybe, and we could debate this, is, is that recidivism is this unsolvable, mystical, problem that all these legislators have fought like tooth and nail and tigresses and tigers for decades to cure and they're being valorous, continuing to fight it. And that's all malarkey. It's all a lie. It's all fakery. It's like, uh, because, because the answer is, is simple, meet their needs. You meet the legitimate frugal needs of former prisoners or really anybody in need and they'll be successful most often. And, you know, we've had people, I think the most difficult diagnosis to me by far is borderline personality disorder. But we've got people with that diagnosis are super successful. Schizoaffective disorder, we've got people with that diagnosis super successful. Um, bipolar, uh, and then schizophrenia. It, you, you know, everybody with with those diagnoses, people with those diagnoses can be successful. They can be, you can be glad to have them as your neighbor, right? And, and communities can be glad to have them employed and living in the communities, but they have to have support to get on their feet. And it doesn't have to be support forever. And it might be support for two years, it might be support for one year, it might be support for five years, but given that support, uh, whether it's from post-prison education program or a family unit like Pete Early and his wife, uh, given that support, people can 
put their lives together. And that's the real sin with me, that, that, that the answer is so obvious, and it's proven, and it just needs funding, and, and, and the Tim Ormsby's of the world uh, refuse to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, so um, that'll be, well, a town hall starting at, 7.30, I think the gates open, the doors open around 6.30, public to come in. The auditorium holds uh, 800, but they want to keep it to 700 because of visibility of the stage and the screen. Um, we'll we'll uh, start the evening at 7.30. Pete Early will keynote. We've got a phenomenal panel, uh, including Rachel. Um, and uh, they'll each speak about what, why these issues are important, and then we'll take Q and A from the audience. So uh, Wednesday, Town Hall, Seattle, uh, starting at seven thirty. Get there early. Uh, if you can't afford a ticket, I don't give a hoot. I'm not trying to sell tickets at five bucks a piece. If you're a UW student, Seattle U student, interested in this broke, don't have any money. If you're a Googler, because we exist because of Google, show your Google ID and you're in free. Uh, but don't let the ticket price stop you from attending. You know, we're looking for interested people um, who can help us sort of join the movement and, and, and move forward. The next two minutes are yours, Rachel. Oh. Yes. <laughs> um. I, I th I'm excited. I think the panel has some really good perspectives from a different bunch of different places. I think you know, Nami and Pete Early, um, you know, a family member and people who are sort of on that have that experience, and Kim, who's done a lot of the work in the in the jails and the community, and then me, who sort of sees them in between in the prisons. Um, so I'm really excited to see hear everybody's perspectives and start thinking about solutions. We all talk about what the crisis is, and then thinking about what the solutions are, there are ways to do this better, and I think um, most of them aren't a mystery, so we need to figure out how we can bring more of those to Washington State. And uh, Rachel, how can uh, people find out more about Disability Rights Washington? So we do have a web page, um, dr-wa.org is my guess, um, AVID is, uh, if, you, if you Google Amplifying Voices of Inmates with Disabilities, you'll get there too. You'll get to the prison page in particular, where we have videos and reports and Facebook. We're also on Facebook. All right. And Ari, your uh, post-prison education program? Post-prison education program, you can Google that. You can go to the website's postprisonedu.org. Search post-prison education program on the Facebook, on Facebook. Uh, and for right now, just please Google Town Hall Seattle, biggest lie ever told. and and be with us next Wednesday. It's really important. All right. So next Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Yeah. start time, Six doors open at 6.30 p.m.? Yeah, I think so. All right. Well, thank you both for coming in. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you.